Okay. Um, so anyway, Ted, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's just hop in and, and right away oh, a little guys. background on Teddy and I. Um, let's start off Lake Forest Academy. You're 16 years old. Um, played in NHL, started around 2007, 2008. Um, let's just kind of go over that six-year period from when you were uh, touching down in Chicago until you played your first NHL game, which I believe was in Edmonton. Am I right, Santa? Yeah, you are. Um, I actually have the first game game sheet here. My parents sent it down, which I thought that was a pretty cool thing to have in my office. But, um, yeah, I didn't really know what to, what to expect. Um, my parents, you know, we got advised back in the day by – and an advisor, obviously, and, and he said, you know, there's a really good prep school. Um, you can probably get a, a really good chance to get a, you know, a free American education out of it. Um, a lot of my friends and players at the time were a lot bigger than me. I was smaller and told I was too slow and not tough enough and all this stuff. All good. So my parents said, you know, let's try to go the education route. And back at that time, um, it wasn't as popular as it is today. I still think it should be more popular, but we can get into that later. Um, and my parents just, they didn't really know. They didn't play a whole lot of sports. They were just kind of going with their gut and, um, they didn't convince me or force me to go. I said, okay, well at the time, you, you know, your parents are your, still to this day, I, they're still the closest people I talk to when I make a big decision. So I, uh, put a lot of faith in their, their trust, I guess, to, to try that route. And, I went down there for one year and the hockey wasn't as good as I, I thought it was going to be. Um, met a lot of great people. It was a really good experience. Um, you know, moving away, I, I turned 16 when I was there. So they dropped me off when I was technically still 15. Um, I think they had a harder time than me. I remember they told me like probably not till five or six years later that they started crying when they left. Cause they were like, what are we doing? You know, we're sending our kids down to America and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so then I actually went back home to Newfoundland and finished school with all you guys. Actually, I think you were away then, right? I was. My yeah. grade 12 year, I went away, and I remember coming back. And back then, there was no MSN or Instagram or anything like that. You didn't know what a guy looked like. So I came back to practice with the Leafs. And, like, I look on the ice, I'm like, who the hell is that guy? He's 6'2". Like, he looks really good. He's tan. The guys are like, that's Teddy. So I'm like, yeah. Oh. So keep yeah. going. So that was a, uh, yeah, and, and that was a good thing for me, too. Uh, you know, I came back home, and – that was, uh, I remember it was my NHL draft year, technically. Um, we're playing, you know, St. John's Main Place and playing high school. And, you know, a lot of the guys were away like you or playing major junior. Um, but I think it just gave me time to grow. For one, I, I grew like a foot and a half in a year. I remember having growing pains and my body was aching. I had to get like arches in my shoes and know what was going on. It just happened so fast. And then it gave me time to develop and grow into my body. And there was no pressure or anything. I, that was one of the most fun years I've ever had, you know, playing with all the guys, me and Cavi were running the power play back in the day. A few times. <laughs> yeah, it was a great time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> never be running any power play. Ever. Uh, no, no. Uh, just give Teddy the rock. That's all uh, I had to do. But we had a, we had a great bunch of guys. Uh, our parents got along really well. We went on a bunch of trips that, you know, we could still sit around, you know, 15 years later and talk about, you know, the little memories and stuff. So I was really fortunate that, you know, I had that much fun. And then after that, I went to, uh, it was the same type of thing. I had a, we, me and Cavi were on the team, and uh, we had a really good run at the Air Canada Cup in Sault Ste. Marie, and a bunch of major junior teams talked to me and, and college teams, and uh, I only would have had three years of major junior because I would have been, you know, 18, 19, 20. My 17-year-old year, I was with the Maple Leafs. And my dad said, he goes, in three years, if you don't, do you think you can play in the NHL? And I said, no, are you crazy? And he said, well, why don't you try to go to college and – get an education and the worst case you can fall back on your degree or meet people down in the States and have a good job and whatever it was. And I uh, ended up going to Saskatchewan and uh, committed to that college route. And then I went down to the USHL for a couple of years and then to Maine and then to the NHL. But it was, uh, I don't want to bore them with all the stories. I lived in about 10 different places chasing my dreams, but uh, everyone has their own path and it, uh, it, it worked out for me for sure. No, and, and that's uh, pretty funny because, like, you actually – there was a stretch of time where when you went out to Notre Dame at age 18, you went to a USHL camp that particular season and got caught, I do believe. Right, like, yeah. Yeah, so they, uh, the USHL, you're only allowed – I believe it's two imports. It might have changed now. 
Um, I went down, had a good camp, and they had two guys there before, from last year that they liked, which I understood. So they cut me. So that was all good. And well, I went to Notre Dame, got drafted by another team in the USHL. And we ended up beating those guys in the finals the next year. So that was pretty cool. And I, I think I led the league in scoring and led the finals in scoring. And I just looked at the coach and I said, uh, thanks for cutting me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's another one of those up yours, bud, moments for sure. And that's I wanted to make that point though, Ted, because a lot of these guys, you know, you think, oh, I get cut from the under fourteen HPP team. Oh God, like I mean, my career is over. The sky is falling. Or like I didn't get drafted at age fifteen. Like oh, I should just pack it in and play high school. Like that's not the case at all. Like if you believe that you're capable of doing it, um, just keep following. Just keep getting better every day. Yeah, um, and, and and I I totally agree with that. And Listen, not everyone that plays hockey, you know, thinks about the NHL. We, we all wish we could. Some people play it for, you know, to, to, to get better at something, to hang out with their buddies, to have some kind of schedule. Uh, I remember we playing an under-16 team. We all played on it. And next year we had our camp in, I want to say, Stephenville for the under-17s. And these two coaches from Grand Falls, uh, they cut me the next year. And they just said, I, you know, I wasn't big enough. I – wasn't doing enough stuff. I remember in camp, I was still scoring as or putting up points as much as I would. And then I, I remember he said something about, I think it was the guy's last name was Gil, I think. Actually, wait a second, Ted. Look, I got this picture. It's in my room that you mentioned under 16 team. Okay. I got a little picture. I think you got the frosted tips going right here. Yeah, I was about Look the shortest guy. That makes sense. Frosted <laughs> tips there. Oh, my God. Like that yeah. is, and you're like 4'11. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I can get a picture from our, uh, Canada Cup or now Telus Cup, and I can show us uh, how you've grown so much. Like, yeah, so much I know, yeah. From the back row in the corner to, like, middle front. <laughs> right, exa exactly, yeah. So, but, you know what, I, I had fun doing it. And, you know, my parents never pushed me in it. They, they did everything they, they could to make sure I could go all the tournaments and, uh, you know, make sure, you know, I, they paid up on time so I, I wasn't missing out on anything. But I had fun. I had a great time. We hung out with all, you know, friends for life, like all you guys are. And I know we live in different spots now, but you can get on a call like this and, and talk. And it feels like we just talked, you know, last week. Um, but I didn't really know at the time. I, in my own mind, I, I really didn't think that I could play in the NHL. You know, we, we watched it growing up. I'll never forget going to the first, my first game, like seeing like Yarmir Yager and Mario Lemieux playing. I was like, man, that must be so cool to be them. I never actually thought that I was going to play with Yarmir Yager in my life. Um, so I, I just enjoyed it. And I, I always just thought, you know, let's just take this as far as it can go. And and if once I started getting like good and recognized a little bit, I was still never drafted. So I was just getting, getting a little traction or talking to some teams and, you know, a, a pretty good agent came to me and blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, let's just see where it can go. And I was like, I honestly thought that I was going to play four years of get a scholarship and then maybe get a try on the AHL or East coast. But I, I really didn't think that I was going to play in the NHL for, for 10, 11 years, but that didn't make me, that didn't make me stop working any harder or not having as much fun. That wasn't the end goal. I just kind of had fun with it. Didn't put too much pressure on myself. You guys both know, I was told my whole life that I, you know, too slow, not tough enough. No, yeah. all that stuff right but I just you know it's not fun to hear that but I, I tried to prove people wrong and say I'll just take this as far as I can go and then if I ever do make it and they try to ask for a favor I just won't talk to them so it's no big deal <laughs> yeah hey uh Teddy how good is uh Yager's here in person you know playing with them being it's around. great yeah it's great volume <laughs> really good volume yeah he was uh I was pretty starstruck when I you know I, was, I got traded to Florida for a playoff run and uh, it's actually a pretty cool stat. I didn't know. My dad told me uh, Yager made some kind of record. He had his 200th assist in the playoffs, and it was assist on one of my goals. So it was pretty cool. Oh yeah, that's wicked. Yeah, but he's a he's a different cat. But he he works really hard. But sometimes morning skate, we'd have we'd go out there with obviously a normal morning skate. He'd come out with tracksuit on, weight vest, no gear, just his tracksuit, uh, ankle weights around his skates, and he'd work on one thing like. 200 reps we're like what are you doing it's not going to happen in the game tonight and sure enough he'd have two goals because that that boy happened it was it was amazing he obviously knew a lot more than what we did his flow was 50 pounds for training yeah yeah <laughs> that's a really good point though ted and i know you're talking about yager and we talked about stamkos a long time ago about how in practice when you were playing in tampa 
you would often just do like one timers for app in morning skate if you had an opportunity like hundreds of them so it just goes to show it's the muscle memory that you're trying to create it's not about how hard the drill is or you know you don't need a million dollars worth of sticks and broken off stuff or you know like some of this extra gizmos and gadgets you know if you have good fundamentals you just want to create muscle memory and work in a subconscious mind so you're just doing it all the time over and over yeah that's a hundred percent right and uh I think now there's so much stuff online. There's, you know, Instagram and YouTube and that's all that stuff is great. But now people are trying to just come up with stuff to like almost gimmicks just to kind of fool parents and, and, Oh, this is, this is what works. And you know, this, all, all this crazy gadget stuff. But at the end of the day, if you, like you said, you're, if you're a right shot defenseman, Cavi, you're a right shot defenseman. Yeah. The puck is going to be in your corner 500 times a game. So you got to know which way the puck bounces, how to pick it up on your forehand and backhand, where someone's coming to try to take your head off if they're hitting, um, how to av- avoid contact, how to stay healthy, all that stuff. And then in the offensive zone too, you can master that blue line, picking the puck off the boards, walking the line, looking for your partner, trying to get the shot through. If you can master those two things automatically before all the other stuff, you're a really good defenseman. So as crazy as it sounds, you can really dumb it down. Obviously, Stammer is a – everyone knows him for his one-timer. But he's, he does – he brings everything else to the table, too. He's just the best at that because he, he works on it so much. Marty St. Louis all the time, too. I remember when I was playing with him, he he won the Hart Trophy one year with us or maybe the Art Ross the most points. But he wasn't satisfied. He was always trying to change his stick, how he was trying to pick up the puck better. There was always little different things that – they want to master and keep getting better at to keep evolving and and growing their game. Well, that kind of transitions us right into talking about Adam Oates. Um, I know you do some skill work with him now. Um, You know, Adam is really, I mean, he works with some of the best players in the world, Blake Wheeler, Mark Scheifele, Zach Parise, Stan Mm -hmm. Coase, and McDavid. A lot of people Mm -hmm. don't realize that he spends a lot of time with McDavid. And when I'm watching some of the goals now, I'm like, man, that's such an Adam Oates thing. The look away shot, the, you know, just the slowing down, the speed change. I'm like, that is, that's working with him. Just kind of talk about what it's like working with Adam and, and how much fun it is and where you guys go and, and so on and so forth. And, and just kind of your role in that, in that relationship. Yeah. So long story short, he, uh, I actually hired him. He coached us in Tampa uh, years ago. Great for you. Assistant coach. Yeah. It was, it was awesome. And I, he's a the coach that's taught us and the, the most of anyone. Coaches have a tough job where, for one, they want to keep their job, so they're they're coaching a system. And when you get to the NHL, I mean, there's 25 players, so it's really hard to, you know, do one-on-one skills with every player. It's more, you know, going over your systems and what you do bad last game as a team. So let's, like, clean up our neutral zone or our D zone or let's work on our power play, which is all just as important. But when you break it down, there's not a lot of one-on-one stuff. And a lot of coaches have a hard time, too. Like, Adam is – He'll let you know too. He's he's a smart guy, and, and he will let he will let you know. But he can back it up. He goes, if anyone want to come to a, like a argument with me, you better have some good ammo because I have more. And it's funny and it's true. But um, you know, if, if a defenseman goes back and gets a puck and, and he whips it, Adam's a big, really big guy on stick. The length of your stick, the curve of your stick. He thinks a curve will really help you be able to pick up pucks better. So if you aren't looking down, you can trust your stick because of repetitions like you guys talk about. And it's like muscle memory. You know where the puck's going. So now I'm looking up already as the puck's coming. I'm not looking down, then up, then over. That's a half second and the play might be gone. You might get your head taken off. So there's a lot of stuff like that. And and if you look on the ice, when we skate with with these guys, uh, you know, there's there's no whistle. There's no crazy drills. The guys aren't flying around. It's really slowing down and it's very cerebral and you can't teach someone something right away going at full pace. Like your brain and your mind, it just doesn't work. You really have to take baby steps with it and get it down and then you can start adding layers to it. And one of Otzi's mottos, it's a, he dumbs it down too. It's uh, he goes, let's everyone play longer because if you play longer, you're obviously you're staying healthy longer. And if you stay and if you play longer and stay healthy, you're making more money. So that's basically what he wants to do. And especially even with kids now, we're trying to, you know, avoid how do you get your head, how do you not get your head taken off? Because it's very dangerous when there's a lot of people flying around the ice and, you know, like Dick said, pucks can bounce either, either way. You can hit a skate, you're looking down. Like let's, let's be smart and let's learn to carry the puck with your head up. And 
how to pick it up off the boards with your head up, how to avoid that contact. And then when you get the basics down, you can start adding layers and the quicker you develop and all that stuff comes together. So it's really interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm having a really fun time doing it. It's a good transition for me and I'm learning more than I ever did when I played. And I, I always joke with them. I said, I wish, you know, you did this, I wish you got fired from Washington six years earlier so we could have hired you before, but, uh, all the players love it. He has a great relationship with all the guys and we travel around in the summertime, see those guys and skate with them. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool. That's definitely a philosophy like uh, that with vision at uh, Cavi and I and, and our staff, we always try to focus on because like, like the other day we put a drill up on, on social, just like a, something you could do on a pond or on like an ODR. Um, you know, you didn't need any gear, just like put the puck up in the dash or get comfortable picking it up and turning both ways and shooting in stride. Mm -hmm. Right. Just, it was like super, super simple drill. And I'm sure there's people out there being like, oh, wow, there's so much more you could do there. It's that you can bring out like really wacky this or that, or no, like how often do you have to do a turn in tight space in the game to create time and space? Like lots. Yeah. A hundred times a game. Yeah. So yeah. like we try to focus on really making sure our techniques are good and heads up and really focus on some of the things that you and I talk about. Like you and I are always going to be hockey nerds. We're always going to be talking about something that we see or mm -hmm. whatever and trying to pick up things that you're telling me and that other guys and kind of formulating um, from there. Right. And, and one of the things is like, um, you know, these guys on Instagram with their like Instagram hands and they're doing these crazy things between their legs and like lifting up a tire and like jumping over two things. Well, Adam always talks about it too. He's like, well, you know, Mark Shifley and, and Connor and, and Wheeler, they're always in the last Connor's always up there. He's, he's the best in the world. Everyone knows that, but we learned Shifley really grew their game the last five or six years, and they, they swear by Otsi, but Otsi goes, hey, if you're playing against Zidane Chara and you're going down the ice, are you going to jump over his stick and then put it backwards and then jump over something else and stop? No, you don't play the game like that. You have to – like Patrick Kane. He'll kill you. He'll yeah, kill you. exactly, and you're dead. <laughs> you're dead. So, like, Pat, everyone, you know, it, and it, the game is going to speed now. It's changing. That That's how it is, but – um. Everyone wants to, you know, be as fast as McKinnon and Crosby. Well, you're not going to be. They're generational talent, and it comes around once every 15 years. But, every, like, Patrick Kane, he's not the fastest skater. But Leon Dreisel, he, he they get moving for sure. They don't want to pick up their speed. But when they have the puck, the game slows down. I don't care how fast you are. They, they'll pick you apart, right? And if you look at that, guys like Kucherov, they're not flying around the ice the whole time. They're in control. They can turn both ways. Their head is always up. They're comfortable with their stick in their hands because they work on it all the time. And when they have the puck, as soon as they get it, their their head is up. And then they know where every the other nine guys are on the ice. And, and this is like a really good analogy. It's it's pretty silly, but it's stupid. So if you if you have if you're you know you work on other stuff or you're you know training too much, you, you should all you have to do is work on your hands and your head. And that's what Adam talks about. So if I have – my phone's in my hand right now, right? So if I'm like this, like, where's my attention? I'm trying to look at you guys, but I don't really have it under control, right? I'm kind of like looking at this. I'm looking at you guys. But if I have my phone like this, now I, I can talk to you guys, and I'm not worried about that, right? If I'm like this, I don't know where you're coming from, Paris here. I don't know if Cav is trying to come across the middle and hit me. So if you can get this under control, your hands, and stick handle with your head up, then – you're in a really good spot and you're going to make plays. All righty. These are some great points, guys. Um, thanks so much for that, Ted, for sure. Um, just from doing scouting and working for the Quebec League, they're often giving me marks and sometimes I'm seeing, they're giving me a guy to watch and I watch him play and I watch probably three games across a couple of months just to see maybe I missed something. And there's so many guys that are like, okay, they're super fast. They have great wheels, but they made like three plays in four games. And the rest of the time, right. passing their skates, they couldn't pick it up. Passes bounced off their blade. They turn the puck goes flying off their stick. I'm like, you know, is this guy supposed to be an offensive player at the next level? But he can't turn both ways. He doesn't see the ice all that well, and he doesn't get in the holes well. I'm like, I don't know if that's going to translate over to the next level. But that's, uh, you know, that's at the end of the day not my decision. But I'll give you my honest opinion on it. Um, let's fire off some NHL questions. Said some rapid fire here. Uh, okay. I'm sure some of the guys uh, on the call want to find out a little bit about the insider life of, of an NHL player. Let's go with hardest player to play against. Uh, like hardest or scariest? Probably both. I, I think I know who you're going to say too. 
Well, I don't know. The hardest is probably like a Nick Lidstrom where you, you think like you, get, you can dump the puck in for a change and you're a young guy and he'll just like tip it out of the air and give someone an outlet pass and the coach is going to yell at you. So and you, you can't forecheck the guy. You're, you're chasing <laughs> him and he'll just. And then Terry Murray's like, geez, you got your toe over the red line. You didn't dump it in properly. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, so like, the, you're a and, then, and he's like, you know, you're not good at the forecheck. Well, how do you forecheck Nick Lidstrom? And, you know, he could skate well. He knew his angles. And he came back, no matter how the puck was bouncing, where it was, he was getting it out clean every time. The scariest was Chris Pronger, I think. Oh, big prong. Yeah, yeah. I can see that too. Yeah, because he'd, he'd, he'd elbow you right in the head or slash you in the face. So that was – like, Charo is obviously scary too, but he was pretty honest. He played pretty honest. Pronger could uh, – he could hurt you at any moment. Well, I well, remember, little, go ahead, AP. I remember, Ted, when it was back 20, 2011 – and I, I was in Toronto at the time because I was up – we were coaching, like, a summer program. And I told – we were texting back and forth because you were in the playoffs playing against Boston. And I was like, you know, like, Chara's, like, g- giving you the gears in the corner. He's like, no, nah, he pins me on the boards. I can't move. He's like, yeah. just, once, once you're there, you're not getting up. So. No, you're, you're done. Now, Chara's up there for sure. I just think as a – with some screw loose type stuff, like, Pronger would – I mean, Chara could hurt you too, but Pronger could slash right in the face. Like, he's – He's taking a lot more suspensions than Chara has, so I'll say he's the scariest. I hate Pronger, those guys. Pronger grabbed uh, Justin Bieber in like in a like a fun game for charity and like squished him in the boards. Like, yeah, he, he thought that was fun. <laughs> I know. Yeah, he enjoyed that. All right, be, uh, best restaurant on the road. Oh, good question. Best restaurant on the road. You're gonna go Manhattan, probably. <laughs> New York City. Um. I was I was a big ste- I was a big steak guy before games. I liked a nice steak, a nice glass of wine. I'm gonna go. Uh, there's a place in Vancouver called Gotham Steakhouse. The guys took me there when I was younger, and kind of always went back there. I thought it was cool, and uh, probably because they ordered like a four hundred dollar bottle of wine and hundred dollar steaks, and I was like, oh <laughs> the best no, of the best. <laughs> and I was like, uh, uh, I, I, like I was kind of looking at prices, and they're like, don't worry <laughs> about the price, kid. So then they they picked it up for me, but. Uh, I was nervous before that dinner, but it turned out good because I didn't have to pay for it. So that, 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 that's just a cool memory. No, that's, that's, that's pretty awesome for sure. I'd say if you were playing a lot now that Vegas are in the league, I'm sure it would probably be some spots you'd like to go there for sure. I know you're a big Vegas guy. Yeah, I, don't, I'm, I actually played a uh, – we used to play preseason games here. We used to do like a Frozen Fury with, when I was with the Kings. So I've been there three or four times. And, yeah, it was for one, it was exhibition, so – we used to uh, take advantage of it and have a little bit too much fun the night before a game. So I didn't have a really good track record of playing games there. So I don't know how – I wonder Vegas are so good. It's because guys uh, guys take advantage of it, uh, the road team, I think. <laughs> oh, we just played three and three, and it's a third of three nights. Like, well, let's just mail this one in. So Yeah. Yeah. We, Cavi and I were there in 2018, and I had salmonella. I had food poisoning. Oh, I had some stories I'll tell you. Some <laughs> stories. You would not have wanted to be my chambermaid, for sure. I was tipping her, I was tipping her big. Anyway, um, favorite place to play on the road? Not long uh, ago. No, that's one of the worst. Um, just being a Canadian guy, I would have to say Montreal is pretty cool. When they play that tune when you're coming out and the, you know, the fans are all like kind of, I don't know, not, I'm sure a lot of you guys have been in the forum there. It's a, uh, it, like they're almost like down on you. Like a, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's uh, it, it's pretty cool. And that's the first time, I, first game I've ever seen in the NHL too. When I was like twelve or thirteen in Montreal, so that place is a uh, special spot for me. All right, Bob Buckingham stacking books or living in Russia? <laughs> um, that's a tough one. I think the books are still down there. I uh, know the books might be down there. Um, Russia, if I ever write a book one day, Russia would be a pretty cool chapter. I was only there for four months, so I'll say that, but it felt like four years and it, uh, it helped pay for a bit of my new house. So I, I can't complain too much. Yeah, I remember you sent me pictures of the, the Toyota 4Runner that was taking you around from place to place. So it's mm-hmm. a, definitely the interesting. I'm sure that's a whole different chapter altogether we could talk about for ages. Mm-hmm. Vetter the person or Vetter the dog? Oh, I got to go with my dog the whole whole time, though. But Eddie Vedder is one of the cool – I guess you got a picture up there one time. He uh, 
we went backstage after one of the shows and had a few beers together. So that, that one made the office for sure. But it's 1A, 1B, but got to go with my dog all the way. Yeah, Ted, for those of you listening from home, Ted's a big, big Pro Jam guy. Actually, Ted loves like a classic rock. Like when we were growing up, I always said like classic rock, like Pro Jam or like Green Day and stuff like that. Like um, Ted was always a big fan of that stuff, like mm-hmm. Smashing Pumpkins, stuff like that. If I'm yeah. right, say oh, yeah. right. Collective, collective Soul back in the day, Creed. Yeah, man, Tragically yeah. Hip. Like that's yeah. Yeah. Big. CCR, of course. We actually went on a road trip one time. We, went, we drove to Halifax with myself. Uh, the Brophies and uh, and Ted's family, and I think we had like two CDs. But, like, and one of those two CDs was a CCR Greatest Hits. So, like, we're like fourteen driving to Halifax with maybe sixteen songs at our disposal. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we listened to "Have You Ever Seen the Rain" like eight thousand times, and I'll still send him <laughs> the odd picture of my phone when I'm like driving down the road and like Lodi comes out, and I'll still send him a picture of like my screen, and be like, "Man, it's like road trip." Yeah, yeah. stuff you you never forget. Alrighty. Um, coolest celebrity you've met in LA? Ooh. Probably Leo. probably Leo DiCaprio. Yeah, he's a, I mean, he, he's probably one of the most famous actors of all time. So that was pretty cool. I actually went to a party at his house. So big house. Was, yeah. And I guess it was a massive house. And I guess that was his party house that he bought just for party. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just for just for parties, um, I'm pretty sure you tried to wander around the house. If I'm right in saying this, and they, I did. You, yeah, I went with another. I went, <laughs> I went with wow. another. It was massive, and I think all the girls at the party were looking for Leo. So me and my other buddy, uh, hockey guy Scotty Upshaw, whose family is actually from Newfoundland, we said let's just go on a tour. So we went, took the elevator, went up to the kitchen. Uh, that was boring. Went up to the bedroom, went up there, opened the door, and Leo was in his room with some friends and he just looked at us and he said, boys, wrong room. We said, certainly is, sir. Closed the door and walked <laughs> <Yeah>. out. <laughs> All right. That, that's awesome. Uh, but one thing you do like living, a part of living in LA is just the kind of anonymity of it. Like you don't like being, uh, I guess, the center of attention. LA is kind of a city where like you can be the most famous person in the world and people just treat you as if you're just a normal, a normal guy or girl. So. Yeah, I guess. But I mean, I was always a middle of the road player. And, and so that was like, not never really a huge factor for me. But at the same time, too, kind of goes with your story. Like, I love hockey, and it's still working. It's given me everything I've ever had. I'm super grateful, I'm fortunate and lucky. I I know all that. But it's nice to have, you know, it's kind of, I, you know, I haven't watched a full hockey game, you know, this year, I don't have the NHL package. It's kind of nice to kind of get away from it and get friends that have different interests and you're not just totally wrapped up in it because I was, it was my job for so long. So I, I kind of like that balance. You know, I obviously watch a lot of the guys clips that, that Adam sends me and we go around in the summer and, and travel and, and talk hockey all day with the guys. So this is a perfect balance for me. And like this morning I was at the beach, you know, my girlfriend was playing in a tournament and, um, the town we live in, you know, it's a beach town. So there's only 25,000 people here and it's a real tight knit community. Um, you know, you can walk everywhere. Like I, I've gone months without driving my car. You take your little beach cruiser bike around, you know, a lot of my buddies have a golf cart, so you can take them around the restaurants right here. Um, so it's a really, it's a really cool spot. And, you know, there's a bunch of guys that are retired down here too. So we have a, a tight group of friends, um, and I'm pretty lucky to live here. I'll say that for sure. Yeah, I mean, Ted Ted sent me some videos of his house, and it is just an absolute pad view of the ocean. It's pretty uh, pretty cool down there. I got to get out there. Uh, Cavi and I are gonna have to make a little road trip. <laughs> road so trip. We'll sleep in one of the like 97 bedrooms in your house, so <laughs> you won't even know we're there. I swear. <laughs> All right. Um, well, let me see. How many bitcoins do you own? Zero. Oh, I thought you were gonna be Bitcoin guy. And last but not least, favorite minor hockey line mate? Uh, it's like St. Charles Maple Leafs minor hockey? Yeah, like growing up, favorite minor hockey line mate, Gonzaga High School line mate. I'm going to say uh, Scotty Brophy. You're full no one, you are no so one. live right now. <laughs> Why? There's no, you, no way. Well, no one, no one worked harder than him. I didn't have to do anything. He just got me the puck, and then it was probably in the back of the other team's net at some point. Cavi can vouch for that. Oh, him Scotty, and Scotty just did everything, and you just been, you just get in the right spot, and Scotty finds you. Scotty was a dog. 
little bro story before we move into the last question I've got here. Little bro story. So we play street hockey up until we were probably 21, 22 years old, just about every day till the sun went down. Ted would agree with me on this one. Cavi wasn't really part of our league because he lived in Logie Bay, but I picked. I was I was a late goalie addition. You it were was, yeah. every now and again. You were. <laughs> Well, like there was like a core of us that played all the time. So we would play. And then there was probably like a six, seven year break of when we didn't play any games at all. So we started to do like these reunion games. So one year we did the reunion game. We lost in like six games. There was always the same two teams, the Ducks and the Oilers. And we were the Oilers and Teddy was on the Ducks. So they would beat us. I think they beat us every single series for like 15 years. So we're thinking there's the second year of doing this. This was like 2014. Brope was living in Toronto. So Brope was like, oh, he's got kids. He can't make it down. We're all like in our early thirties at this point. So you know, he, he can't go. And we're all excited. We think we got a chance to win because Brope's kind of like the glue of their team. Um, played a couple hundred games in the queue. Um, won like every Canadian national championship there is to win. Awesome guy. I'm going to have to put him onto this YouTube for sure. Definitely pull it, like pumping his tires for sure. But um Nobody knew that Brof was coming, but Teddy at the last second decided to book him a flight to fly home on like a Wednesday night and fly back to Toronto on like a Friday morning before he went to work. So, but we didn't know about it. So we were all thinking like, Brof's not going to be there. This is our one chance to win. We haven't won in decades. <laughs> we haven't won in decades. So I'm like, all right, this is our time. Teddy was playing with the Oilers at the time. So... We, he brought us, he set us up. He bought us all this new like Oilers Easton gear. So we had like Oilers t-shirts, bags, toques, baseball hats, underwear, you name it. We had it Oilers. So like we thought we were like the bee's knees. We're going into this game. We're going to beat them for the first time in forever. And we're all excited. So we're skating around and we play roller, roller hockey. So we're warming up on the tennis courts and I'm getting ready to do my anthem as I always do introduction of the lineups. And out of the woods, all you hear is like bang, 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 bang. And out comes Brophy out of the woods. We didn't know about it. Their team knew about it. They went absolutely bananas. Our team's morale went from like here. Well, to like, demoralized. That was the best $500 I've ever spent in my life, I think. <laughs> It was the worst $500 that I've ever experienced. I, that was a horrible feeling for us. We got our butts absolutely whipped in about 50 minutes. Game mm. over. And boys are like, all right, boy, like we could play two series right now. We could play like <laughs> games to five. And the boys just absolutely laid the wood to us. It was, they took us to the woodshed. It was cruel. Anyway, that's just a little story of Scott Brophy and, and the guy he is and, and the relationship him and Teddy have. Well, what's crazy is about that league AP, two NHLers and then, like, a lot of pro players. Like, who would have thought that, like, friends versus friends, you create that many people playing at a high level? It was nuts when you think about it. Yeah, I mean, I just think part of it was because we had so much fun playing hockey. We'd just play all day long. I mean, that was there wasn't as much structure and organization of hockey here. And we just – I mean, we'd play – Sometimes we just wouldn't go to school in the afternoon. We'd play right till it got dark. And that, I know, that was great. That led, to some loved it, yeah. man. that led to some arguments, like the goal would go in, but we wouldn't know it was in because it was so dark up in the park. And like, I know. oh, there'd be some fights. Anyway, yeah. that's a whole different yeah. story. <laughs> that's a whole different story, brother. Anyway, um, some advice. So we've got a lot of 14, 15, 16-year-olds on this call, Ted. Let's just go over just some things like – um, Carter is from one of the guys uh, Carter Lambert is from Twillingate he emailed me and said AP like you know what do you think about somebody going away at 14 15 16 is it necessary should I go should I not uh, and just give us some advice uh, like from your career and just from your goings on like what the best route would be or what, what you think just a couple of some advice here yeah and listen I'm not involved in day-to-day -day like you guys are um so I'm, I'm not around the game as much. I know from down here, there's a lot of even more politics and money involved like than we were growing up. You know, there's kids playing now year round. Um, me personally, I think all of us, we all play different sports. And I think that really contributed to how good I turned out of hockey. Like I, I needed a break sometimes. So I, I played soccer or I tried to play golf or I tried to play, you know, baseball. Um, and then, you know, I take a month off and when I was 14 or 15 and I'm like, oh, I for forgot how much I, I loved hockey again. Um, but now at the same time, too, you can argue the other way that if, you know, kids aren't getting on the ice as much, then they feel like you're getting a step behind. But I think you're so young at that age, unless you're a McDavid or someone else, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's any 
pressure to, to go away. Hockey's getting better back home. Um, you know, there's, you know, since I came up, there's probably, uh, you know, there's seven or eight of us in the league at that one point. There's some good young kids coming up now. Hopefully Alex Newhook will give a lot of the young kids back home, you know, they can look up to him. He could have went to major junior if he wanted to. Um, I know major junior sounds cool. You know, you play for the Mooseheads and, you know, you're in a cool city and it's like, you know, almost semi-pro, whatever you want to call it. But he could have went and did that. He went to Boston College. He's still playing on the world junior team. He's still a first round draft pick and he's going to have a good NHL career. Now, if he didn't play in the NHL, he's going to one of the top education schools in America. That's, you know, $50,000 a year. And he's networking and meeting people from all over the world. And if he didn't play hockey, that's fine too. He, you know, he could work, have a great job in Boston. He could have a great job in New York city, or he can move back home and have a job. I think you have to plan that, that you're not going to make the league. So what is going to set yourself up <laughs> if you don't make it? If you do, great. I never thought I, I could. And I did. And that's a cherry on top. I, I was lucky. And what, you can call it whatever you want. But this, not the numbers are the numbers. I, like Someone sent me a stat the other day. It's like 0.002% of hockey players make the NHL. So there's millions of people that play. And there's only 600 people in the league a year. So you really have to – you can still – set up your dreams and work as harder than the next person. You can do all that, but you really have to set yourself up for after and give yourself the best chance of life. I think so. I, I could be wrong, but that's, that's from, from my perspective and my path and, and what I've seen. That's so, what, uh, what I'd tell every parent. Some great points there too. And, and I think what you said there, that last sentence of just, okay, what do I got afterwards? You know, mm -hmm. you want to be able to plan for after and, and having an education, not, you don't fall back on education anymore. It's something that you stand on and right. it's so important to have that. And I mean, worst case scenario, you you get your education and you, and like you said, there's multiple different avenues you can go from there. And some guys stay working in hockey. Some guys don't, but there's lots of different avenues now. And I think it's starting to get more out there that it's okay to go play, you know, junior A in the U S and play D3. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, development takes different, different times for different people for sure. Um, last, actually one last question I had, Ted, LA life. What's it like, brother? Um, you love it down there. I know you love it down there. You're never going to come back to this cold weather. I, I do love it. And I, I do love Newfoundland. Um, I used to come back a lot more when my grandparents were alive. I, I still got to get back more. Obviously the last, you know, year or 13 months has been hard to, uh, to come back and I've impossible to come back with all the COVID stuff going on but um it's great it's it's really laid back like I said before um people think of LA and they think you know the hustle and bustle and the Hollywood stuff that's all cool if you want to you know see a basketball game or a concert or whatever you can do anything up there and it's 45 minutes away but um we're all beach bums man we all live there's like 15 of us the hockey guys that live within you know two blocks of each other uh we play beach volleyball we golf we hang out, we all get together, you know, for dinners and for beers in the summertime or for days off, you know, we've got a good relationship with the wives and their kids. So life is pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty easy going down here. And obviously you have the weather that, that makes it, you know, easy. But uh, I, yeah, like I said, I, w I wake up every day and I look at the ocean. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm lucky. I think that's a good point uh, to make there uh, just from a, like a player perspective or I'm listening on this call. Um, you were very, very smart with your money. Um, you invested, you were very like, even at a young age with your first NHL contract, you're probably, you probably still got some of that money put away somewhere in investments. And if I can recommend anything to these younger viewers is making sure you're smart with your money. If you do make it to that level or you're playing professional hockey or you're doing this or that, you know, put, put some away. Don't just spend it on lots of stuff and it doesn't, really appreciate value be smart with your money and I mean Ted I was talking to him earlier on I said you know joking around you could probably live off the dividends of your of your uh, investments so I think it just goes to show you can you know be very very smart with your money and Ted has been incredibly smart with his money um, since I've known him I mean so I think that's just something to take away from it um, uh, living down in LA and just being smart uh, overall um, Ted actually guys I'll, well, I'll throw a give you some time here if you want to ask a couple of questions um i know ted's got a busy schedule and stuff like that but then down the u.s it's more of a yolo um we're not in lockdown down there so uh, if anybody wants to fire on uh, turn your mic on and turn your screen on you got to turn your screen on to ask a question though 
uh, feel free to fire away. We'll take a couple and, and then Ted can go on and, uh, and uh, do his thing. Don't all ask at once, guys. Well, while someone's got the courage to step up in, like, guys, like, Teddy, like, the year that we played with uh, – he was grade 12, I was grade 11 with the uh, Maple Leafs. And, uh, like, Teddy was MVP of the tournament and still never got a sniff. Had to go, get cut from teams, make teams. So, like, if you think things are tough, like, everyone battles to make it to where Teddy has got to there. He was undrafted. Like, he was the best player, like – on every team you came through, but like you might get through coaches that don't like your style, like just learn from those, even though like, you're not on the same page with them and continue to work. Uh, and eventually if you work hard enough, you'll get an opportunity. You just got to make the best of it. When Teddy got his, he didn't let it go. And that's just something that you got to think about as you're training right now. I know we're in lockdown, but who's taken like the initiative to be committed to their craft, like during these times. So that's something that I always looked up to you, Teddy, like when you were going through, like you didn't have to come back and play that year, but mm. it really worked out. You had fun with it. And like, it almost propelled you into your next chapter. And it was awesome to see. Yeah. That gave me a lot of confidence to come back and, you know, playing against my peers, but I also had a lot of fun too. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I talked about the politics and stuff earlier, but, and if you get caught, you know, you know, you can say the coach doesn't like you and, and that, all that stuff's true. Cause it, it's happened to me. But you just, you just can't let it get it down. You got to keep going out and have fun and take your punches. And a lot of people, adversity is going to happen in all different forms of life, not just hockey and school yeah, right. and, and life. And you fail your driver's test. There's going to be stuff that's going to teach you a lot of a lot of messages, and it's going to teach you a lot of, in life and propel you to late. You know, t teach accountability and and teamwork and and how to get along with 20 people and stuff like that. So there's a lot of intangibles that are really brought you and at the time we didn't really know how important they were going to be in life no. and uh but as long as you have fun you work hard then you know you can take it as far as you really want cavi right. is melissa cutting your hair during the covid or what like you got that flat bowl cut going tonight well like a little cowlick there ap that you might not know about but uh it's just natural uh you know herbal lessons right you know like just do natural so you can't really do much about it right, <laughs> All right. i don't have the dippity do going like you no, I just put a bit of water. I put a bit of water in me. Oh, that's bullshit. My hair is that long. I had to do something with it. It's like literally like just a big, you know, I haven't got a cut in like six weeks. So any, anybody got any questions, guys? Fire away. Don't be shy. I mean, Ted's uh, super easy to ask questions too. So actually, before I don't know if everybody was in on this call. Um, Ted and I share a little something in common with our teeth. Ted got his, a bunch of teeth knocked out when he was in what 18 Ted just tell what happened tell a little story about what happened with that yeah I was 18 and uh I Piercy and Cav might tell you to back check if a guy has a breakaway but I might tell you kids not to do that uh the guy had a breakaway in, <laughs> the guy had a breakaway in overtime and if I think if, if you have a breakaway and you, you have to back check like trust your goal your goal is supposed to help you bail you out sometimes so I went in on a break the guy had a breakaway long story short I dove tripped him up didn't get the puck. He fell down. He skate came back, kicked me in the mouth. I lost six or seven teeth. I was trying not to cry, picking up my teeth on the ice. My, you know, second year away, you know, the boys were older and bigger and tougher than me. So I was trying to act tough. The guy ended up getting a penalty shot in overtime and scored. So it was a waste, <laughs> it was a waste of a back check. So from then on, my back checking skills diminished. And if you have the puck, guys, if you have the puck a lot, you don't have the back check. So keep that in mind. Anybody got some questions, guys? Everybody's pretty quiet, so. Um, so, all right, I'd like to thank Teddy for – oh, actually, we got one? Yeah. All right, fire away. Uh, Teddy, do you remember anybody by the name of George Bursell? Yeah, he coached me in uh, Mary Queen of Peace, I want to say. Yeah. Yeah, he's right here next to me. Oh, tell him I said Hi. Hi, Chad. How are you, buddy? Good, man. Good to hear from you. Yes, boy. Been a long time. Yeah, you're you're looking good. Noah's my grandson. Okay, awesome. <laughs> well, teach him what you taught. Teach him what you taught me, and you'll be all good. <laughs> no, it's uh, Ted's the pride of Regina Place for sure. Anybody else, guys? Speak now or forever hold your peace.
Teddy, what's uh, what's a girlfriend playing? And you said she's in the tournament. Uh, what's she playing? She plays beach volleyball. So she uh, she's a professional beach volleyball player. And I was I have a joke with her. She's they finished number two in the world last year, and they're they're oh, supposed yeah. to be in the Olympics last summer. Um, so it's two on two. They're uh, I always joke with her too. I wish I was as good of a pro as she is. She's pretty dedicated and she works super hard. She'd be she's someone I should have looked up to even more. Um, but yeah, she she works really hard. Uh, she got a good opportunity to win or to medal at the Olympics coming up here. So, and she keeps me in line too. So I got the best of both worlds. So I'm, but it's oh, yeah. funny. I, I built this house. I thought I was you know cocky and the best athlete. Now now I'm the second best <laughs> athlete in my own house. So yeah, well, it's like fat that sport, you got to be in tremendous shape. So I'll be lo- looking forward to tracking her in the Olympics. For yeah, sure. for sure. Yeah, you'll see her. He's just being humble, though, guys. Like, Teddy growing up was a tremendous athlete. Like, we played the TPC at Tampa Bay. This was probably, like, what, four or five years ago, Ted? You and me, Murphy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you were, you were shooting, like, low to mid-80s on a TPC course. So, like – and you just picked up golf at that time. You don't even play for a couple of years. I've right. been – since, like, I was, like, four years old, and you whooped, their, you whooped my butt. So, uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't good. Like, Ted was a really good soccer player. So, you know, always be playing every sport you can – the summertime and and I, I don't really believe you get ahead in June or you get ahead in May or you get ahead in July um so getting better at just working on other sports and you, you get better indirectly and I think that's so important totally all right guys we're gonna let they're gonna wrap this up here now um thank you very much for Ted taking some time out of his busy schedule um to to jump in with us here today I know there's a four and a half hour time difference so I mean he's probably right around supper time you know, Friday night being able to do this for us. It is greatly appreciated. I hope everybody learned something from this today. And, um, you know, hopefully get to see you guys again real soon. I know it's been a real tough stretch the past couple of weeks, you know, a lot of inside, a lot of isolation, a lot of uh, lockdowns, but try to stay active and download the COVID app and make sure you're staying safe and, and keeping everybody else safe around you. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Take care, Ted. It was good to yeah. chat with you. Yeah, it was good to keep him up with you hey, guys, too. Hey, can I say one more? Or George wants to say something. Uh, yes, yes, Teddy. Uh, congratulations on your induction into Newfoundland uh, Hockey Newfoundland Hall of Fame. I just oh, thank you. you. Yeah, I know. I was. Uh, I wish they kind of pushed it back a little bit so I could actually make it home for it. But uh, I think my, my parents went out and accepted it for me. Um, it's pretty cool for my whole family. But like I said, I wish it was – different time so I could have went and, and you know been there for the ceremony but uh, you know people are in way worse spots and missing an event and during this COVID stuff so I guess I can't complain too much yeah anyway congratulations buddy thanks man all righty guys thanks so much for taking the evening out uh, yeah. jumping on this call and uh, we will see you guys and talk to you guys soon next guest to be announced soon thank you okay, see you guys thank you are they on, guys? Thank you.